uh, and it will propagate out. So it can propagate out along y direction, but it can also propagate out along z direction, uh, x direction. But it won't propagate along z direction. That's because in this direction, the transverse component of the electric field is zero. The transverse component of the electric field in this direction is zero. The only transverse component, they exist along perpendicular to the oscillation direction. And the more you are perpendicular, the, the higher is the strength. And as you become less and less perpendicular to this direction, you become the, the vector becomes smaller and smaller. The transverse electric vector. So the large just electric vector, transverse electric vector in that direction. So that's why we know we draw the wave in that direction. If you have an oscillation in this axis, then the wave either emit in that direction or in this direction. So a propagation is direction where the propagation direction uh, in any way, either it is in that case or in that case, is given by E cross B. So E cross B would give you the direction of propagation direction at any location. You are at, if you are at this location, uh, then E should be in that direction, B should be in the Y direction, so that the propagation direction would be satisfied by E cross B equation. So this is the electric field vector which, we, which I draw here. Uh, uh, And it oscillates with time, it's oscillated with position. So as you so there are two ways of looking at it. Either look at a particular point or just take a snapshot and both will give you a sinusoidal waveform. And then you have a magnetic field B which is perpendicular to both which is perpendicular to the electric field and they propagate like this. So what would the, so if you know the magnitude of the electric field, so this is how the magnitude of the electric field oscillates with time, uh, and this is how the amplitude of magnetic field would oscillate with time. So the magnetic field the amplitude is given by this relation, because this is what we saw, and this would be true for a case about because electric field and magnetic field perpendicular on and they are propagating its free space. So this condition is satisfied. So the G condition is satisfied with the, so from this, is you can just divide it by C and you would get the magnetic field and it will be given by that. This is the that these two amplitudes are connected and they are not independent. So if you know the magnitude of one, you know the magnitude of the other. You can basically they are, they depend on each other. So A is changing and it is producing the other thing. And that thing again changes and it produces the first thing. So that's why, that's how those two fields are connected. The electric field that changes where magnetic field produces that. Magnetic field that changes electric field produces that. And that sustains this oscillation. Otherwise, the Gazo terms, Maxwell equation, there's a now the changing fields really won't have such a OK, so, what's, so if it's propagation in this direction, electromagnetic waves have energy and they have momentum. Energy is obvious because we have already looked at, for example, the condition. If you have an electric field, then the energy density, if you have in a certain volume, if you have an uh, electric field, then the energy density is given by E by epsilon E squared. That's the energy density, that's the energy per unit volume. But this is electric energy. I can also write magnetic energy. That would be 1 over 2 mu naught E squared. So what's the total energy in such an electromagnetic wave which is present? Of course, it should be the sum of both. 1 over 2 epsilon naught E squared plus 1 over 2 mu naught E squared. That would be the total energy which would be which this wave would be carrying in itself. So, but you also have a relation between B and C, so if R, which is this one, so if I replace it here, this is 1 over 2, epsilon naught, E square, plus 1 over 2, mu naught, B is equal to E by C, so this would be equal to E squared by C. 
c square. So let me rewrite it. U x equal to one over two epsilon naught e squared. One over c squared is equal to or c squared equals to one over mu naught epsilon naught as c is equal to one over mu naught epsilon naught square root. This is what we had. So our basket yeah, this is c squared c one over c squared. This would be equal to mu naught epsilon naught. Basically, the same term, which tells you that the energy density which is stored in the electric field is exactly equal to the energy which is stored in the magnetic field part of the electromagnetic field. So, both the electric field part and the magnetic field part they carry the same energy or the same amount of energy. So, the total energy, which is the electromagnetic energy, then just the sum of half and half, this would be equal to epsilon naught e squared. So this is energy density and if there is a wave which is somewhere there, if I know the electric field amplitude and the magnetic field, uh, even the electric field amplitude I can tell you how much energy is stored in the wave which it is carrying. But an important thing is because the wave is propagating in that direction. So what should be important is for example, if I take an area A, a sheet of area A which is perpendicular to this propagation direction. What normally we are interested is in how much energy is passing through this area per unit time. So what we are interested in is the energy flow. The energy flow rate. And then is the energy per unit area per unit time. This is the thing which we are normally for, uh, because you have a propagating thing. If you have a propagating thing, you would like to know how, how much does this thing propagates across the current cross section area. This thing, OK. So what would be the energy, for example? So let me take an area. <coughs> So let's say this is an area, A, and some field is propagating through it. To make things easier, what I, I would assume that let's say there's an electric field which is constant in amplitude is propagating through it. I would I would assume constant electric field because it's easier to calculate. But the result is equally valid for that thing. So, so how much energy would pass through it? So let's say if I draw a box, so if there is an electric field here at a certain distance, let's say this distance is C <coughs> delta T. So in time delta T, this vector would just pass through this area A. So which means that in time, delta t, all those electric fields which are inside the box, they would pass through it starting from st starting from here and then each one would pass. So the moment, so this would be the last one which would pass through it. Make sense? So how much energy, the total energy which passed through it in time delta t, how much would be that energy? That would be the energy density multiplied by the volume of this box. So let's say I call this volume B. What is the volume of this box? So this I know this is epsilon naught e squared. 
the volume of this box is C delta T multiplied by area. True. Ab we are interested is energy per unit area per unit time. So this thing I call is U or delta U, which is the energy which flows per unit time delta T by unit time delta T. So what I am interested is energy per unit area per unit time. And there is something which has a certain name for it in electromagnetic electromagnetism. Uh, it is noted normally by S. So what is this thing now? This is equal to epsilon naught e squared i multiplied by c. So let me rewrite it. What multiply it by c and divide it by c. So what I get is c squared divided by c. So multiply it by c divided by c. Epsilon naught e square c square is 1 over mu naught epsilon naught c. True? This thing is equal to, so epsilon naught starts out, what you have is 1 over mu naught e e by c. True? So e squared I have split it into e into e divided by c. What is e by c? That's p. So that's equal to 1 over mu naught e into b. So this your s, which is the energy flow per unit time. But e and b are always perpendicular to each other. True? So you can define an s vector which is equal to 1 over mu naught e cross b. And E cross B would give you the direction of the energy flow, which is S. S vector kya hoega? Your propagation direction hai, that would be E cross B. So it makes sense if the wave is propagating along E cross B, then its energy should also flow along E cross B. This vector, this vector is called as pointing vector. And that tells you how much energy flows and in which direction per unit time. Similarly, you can find for momentum, what is the momentum carried by each photon? So it's a bit involved, it's involved calculation for momentum here, but I would just give you a simple explanation. What is the momentum carried by a single photon? So the momentum, let's say, This is given by the energy of the photon multiplied by C. So if I say what should be the momentum flow through this area A per unit time per unit volume. It should be the energy flow per unit area per unit time divided by the C. This should be equal to because you have a C relation over there. So if you know the energy flow, then you also should know what's the momentum flow. So the momentum flow, which I would represent by P, this would be equal to. 1 over mu naught multiplied by C e cross B. That would be the amount of momentum which flows there. So electromagnetic wave, so I, did you do momentum of photon in modern physics? No. Okay, you can have m is equal to h by p 
So if you know a lambda, you do have a corresponding p with it. There's a degree of it. Well, this one way of looking at it. So what does it mean that if you have electromagnetic wave, it would carry momentum with it? So if you know the lambda of your electromagnetic wave, you should be able to derive from the momentum of it for a single photon, but it's equally valid for an electromagnetic wave if you know it's electric field vector and you know it's a magnetic field vector. So uh, a very known example of it is uh, you have you have comets which have tails of it. So you have a sun and you have a comet somewhere. So what is a comet made of? It is normally a big chunk of matter with a large amount of dust particle which is close to it. So, and then dust form a tail. So let's say if the comet is here, the tail is to produce a cable, it produces in this direction. But if the comet is here, the tail which is produced is in that direction. If it is here, the tail is produced in that direction. Always away from the sun. Because what you have is electromagnetic wave which are going out and those will impart a momentum to it and you know if you have a certain momentum, momentum can apply a force on certain particles. So all the dust particles which is part of the comet, they are repelled away due to the radiation of the sun. It's partly the explanation for this phenomenon. The comets, the tail of the comets is given by the momentum which is carried by those electromagnetic waves which are coming out of the sun. So that's one illustration of it. There was another, you can e even do something very, for example if you have an oven and you have a heated oven so that atoms are coming out of it, so you have atoms which are coming out. What you can do is you can, if they are coming out with certain velocity V, what you can do is you can put laser, you can make laser incident on the other from the opposite side. And what would a laser do? Because it's a very intense field of electromagnetic wave, it would impart a momentum in the opposite direction and it can really slow down this these atoms. So these atoms then are called as cooled atoms and once they are slowed down, you can really slow down at them. And this is what this Nobel Prize for this year was about, partly. With how you can slow down atoms. So that's basically, if you have an electromagnetic wave which is incident on certain atoms, it can really, it carries momentum, if it carries momentum, it would, it's just like two balls, so a ball is coming, a small ball is hitting, and many, many small balls are hitting from the opposite side and eventually this would slow down. So, because a single beam of laser, it has billions and billions of photons, so this striking event occurs very frequently, so you can really slow down right into this. Of course you can't slow, if you shine a laser on the screen, you won't push it out because it has such a large mass, but you can do it for it. Because the momentum is very small, because it's given by the energy of the photon here by C, so C has a large number, so overall the momentum which the photon carries is very small, but if you have many, many photons, it will carry a large momentum. Okay, so this was one part of the lecture which I wanted to discuss. Now I'm coming to the next part. Any question in here? So, in essence, what it is that you have electromagnetic wave, you can from the, from the pointing vector, you can find how much energy it is carrying, and from this vector, you can find how much momentum it is carrying. So, you now I come to a slightly different topic, which are inductors uh, circuits. So, for inductor, we look at Certain circuit which is made of an inductive element and a capacitive <coughs> element, and this circuit we call as an LC circuit. We have already have a look at this. So let's say this is E. So I can assign my polarities and let's solve the circuit. We have already done it, but without this thing, but let's do it. 
Now, so what would be the momentum drop across this? The, sorry, the potential drop across an inductor. This would be LDI by dt. And let's say I I start from here and then I move around the circuit and end up here. Then you have minus e from this side, and you have a plus q by c from the capacitance, and this would give you zero. So that's the loop equation for such a circuit. Let me rewrite it. So this is equal to L di by dt plus q by c. So q I can write as i of t dt integral, because that's what is i? i equals to t q by dt, so q should be the integral of i with respect to that. So that would be 1 over c i dt, that's the equation I have. If I take the derivative of this thing, so t e by dt, this is a, let's say this battery is not changing, it's constant, so this thing would be equal to a 0, but then I have to take a differential on the right hand side as well, so that would be equal to L d2i by dt squared plus 1 over c, a differential uh, of an integral is the quantity itself, so that would be equal to i. Okay. So basically, you take a derivative of the integral, which would be what you have inside. So that's the equation you have, and that's equal to zero. So if I rewrite it, this would be equal to minus one over L C into R. So that's a function I of t, which has this differential equation to. So you have a certain function which you derivate it twice and you get the same function multiplied by minus. So last time you did solve it and you get the familiar solution and that would be equal to a certain constant, let's say I not e raised to power i 1 over mc. So, you can write it as I naught cos 1 over LT or you can also have a sign, sign forward. What is, when you have an exponential whenever you have an I with it, it would be a cos or a sign forward. So such a thing, such an exponential with an i in the exponent will give you an oscillator signal. So there's the thing, but you can also have different, you can equally have a sign solution for it. This is something which we did last time. So last time we had we solved it for charge and we end up with a cos. We take a derivative, we end up with a sign. So just to be consistent, we have to make sign over there. Okay, but anyway, it's a sign of This thing is what? This is frequency. So I can write this as I naught sign omega t, such so that omega in this case is equal to 1 over L C square. There's something which is called the resonant frequency of the circuit. means that if you draw current as a function of time, what you should get is a fully sinusoidal solution. Uh, sin here, so That would be the solution, the form of the solution. It's a 
an oscillating circuit which oscillates at a certain frequency, and that frequency is given by therefore. So if you change L or you change C, you change the resonant frequency of that circuit. And that's what forms the tuning circuit of a radio, for example. What you have in there is a circuit which is so a tuning circuit which is connected to a an antenna. So antenna we already say so. The tuning circuit is oscillating, the antenna will also oscillate to the resonant frequency. Let's, let's include a resistive element in there, in the circuit, so that you have an arc LC circuit. There's a second order differential equation in I. So I is your variable as which you want to find. Oh, oh sorry, the function which you want to find out of such an equation. So in this case, what we had was this thing was missing. There was no R term in that one. You had an oscillatory, a simple oscillatory solution, but this is slightly more complex. Have you done differential equations? What would be its solution? It would have solution of the form e to the power lambda t. That would be a solution of the form such that lambda is given by an equation which is a characteristic equation which would be given by e lambda squared plus r lambda plus 1 over c is equal to 0. So if you know the roots of this equation, which is called as a characteristic or auxiliary equation, then you can put those lambdas in there and you would get your solution. So that would be the form of your the, the solution for this equation. So let's try to find out what is that lambda. So lambda would be equal to minus r plus minus r squared minus 4 L by C square root divided by 2 L. This basically your solution of a this characteristic. True? So you have you get two solutions. You get a lambda plus solution which is minus r plus r squared minus 4 L by C divided by 2 L and you get a lambda minus which is minus R by 2 L minus R squared minus 4 L by C divided by 2 L. These are the two solutions you get. You would have, the I of T would have two solutions. One would be E raised to power lambda plus T and one would be equal to E raised to power lambda minus because it has two roots. So 
But in general, you would have a solution of the form that you can make. If you have this solution possible, you have this solution possible, you can equally make a linear smooth position of the two solutions. That's what is always true for any linear differential equation. Is how many solutions you have, you can just add them up with a certain coefficient, and this would also be a solution. So that's a general solution of such a differential equation. Uh, the, so this is the form of the solution, but now this depends on what these values are. So you have different regimes over here. For example, if r squared, let me take the case, if r squared is greater than 4L by C. That is case number one. What would be this, this thing? This thing is larger than this thing. So the square root would give you a certain positive quantity. So let me write as lambda plus would be equal to alpha, which is this thing, plus a certain constant beta, which is that thing. So and lambda minus will give you alpha minus. So let me write it this way. So alpha I'll define as equal to r by 2l and beta is a certain number which is given by r minus 4 l by c square root divided by 2l. Okay? And it's a real number because this is positive. So what would be the solution then? do again rewrite is so that will be the form of solution what you have are two exponential functions but no you don't have any i over there which means that you have an exponentially decaying function because there is a minus over there and there is a minus over there so what you have is an exponentially decaying solution. So if you note it, so it is a sum of both solutions. So at smaller a, uh, a smaller t, this would be dominant, and at larger t, this would be dominant, because this, this is a smaller number, this is a larger number in the exponential. So you have any exponential function. So let's say it is i of t you would have a solution of such a form. This that would be how this solution would look like because both of those parts are exponentially decaying. Let's take the second case, which would be the case where r squared is less than 4 L by C. So if r square is less than 4 L by C, what you have here inside is a, a complex number. So you can write r squared minus 4 L by C divided by 2 L as You can write this thing, which is the second part of the solution, 
in this way, it will become, it'll become complex. If B prime is given by that thing. So the solution becomes of a form. I of t would have e raised to the power minus alpha plus i beta into t and e raised to the power minus alpha minus i beta. Okay, so what you have now is, when we write this, this is e raised to the power minus alpha t e raised to power i beta prime t e raised to power minus alpha t e raised to power minus i What is this function? This is an exponentially decaying function like this. What is this function? Well, it has an i in there, so it would have cos beta t plus i it would be a sinusoidal function. So what you have is a sinusoidal function <coughs> multiplied by an exponentially decaying function. So let me plot those things. If you have is so this part one part is a exponentially decaying function, the other part is a sinusoidal function. Which oscillates with a frequency beta prime. So that omega with which it oscillates is given by beta. Beta prime because that's that's just like sine omega t. So that omega is equal to beta prime which is given by that thing which is 4 L by C minus R squared by 2 L. True? So you have an oscillatory function, you have an exponential function. What should be the product of those two? So the product would be an oscillatory function We would start with oscillation, but the solution would quickly decay and it becomes so such that if you can plot this, this part would give you that exponential decaying part, which would be e raised to the power 1 and 40, and this part would give you the oscillation. So that's this. Yes. So the frequency would be this thing. This would be the frequency. So, so this solution would have this part and this solution would have this part. Overall, you can make a linear superposition of the two and what you would end up is solution of the form which is i of t is to e e raised to the power minus alpha t cos beta prime t plus b e raised to the power minus alpha t sin beta t that will be the form of the solution. So you can write as this equals to e raised to the power minus alpha t a cos beta t plus b 
sine beta t or you can write in a super minus alpha t into a cos omega t plus b sine omega t and then omega now is given by beta prime which is equal to 4 l by c minus r squared square root divided by 2 l you can also rewrite as this equal to 4 l by c divided by 4 l squared minus r squared by So this one I also, also introduce it there. So that equals to 4 L by C, 4 L by C, 1 over L C minus R squared by 4 L squared. That's your omega. So if R is 0, if R is 0, the omega which is the regular frequency would simply be equal to 1 over L C square root, which is already, which I showed it for, which is this thing. But when you have a resistor in there, your frequency, your overall frequency changes as well. So this is the second condition. What about the third condition? That R squared equals to 4 L by C. That's the third case. What would happen to the stuff in that square root? So if R squared is equal to 4 L by C squared, this whole thing would become 0 and you would only be left with minus r by 2 n power. So in this case, i of t would be equals to e raised to power minus alpha t because there is the only part which is left. Uh, but you should have two solutions. So you have another solution as well. If you multiply e to the power alpha t by t, this is also a solution. We can check it from there. So you would have a solution of the form A plus B. So that's the third condition. And what is this? It's again an exponentially decaying function. So what's the difference between the three cases? So the first one was also an exponentially decaying. Uh, let's combine all three, and I will give you what does it mean. This is given by e raised to power minus alpha minus beta t or e raised to power minus alpha plus beta t. What are the solution? e raised to power minus alpha t, e raised to power i, beta free time. And this one is simply e raised to power minus alpha t and t e raised to power minus alpha t. So these are the three solutions you have. And let's plot all of them together. P, this is I of T. This one is simply an exponentially decaying function, uh, but it decays somewhere like this. That's the first part of the solution. The second part of the solution is a solution which oscillates but it decays as it oscillates so there's the second solution and the third solution is this solution so where it decays fast so it just complete one oscillation and it just decays and it doesn't come out so this thing is called as critical damping
this thing is called as Warden solution and this one is called as the under damping solution. So what does, what does damping does? It slows down oscillation or decreases oscillation. So if you have some, some damping and where does this damping is coming from? It's coming from the resistance. So when you have some damping, which means that the LC circuit can oscillate, but those oscillations will die out in time. So you have an under damp condition in which oscillation can be sustained, but damping is a bit less so that those oscillations occur. In over damping case, the damping is so strong that the system can't even start oscillating and it would slowly decay out in time to zero. In the third case, which is the critical damping, you have an intermediate case where the damping, so before the damping was small, you could oscillate a bit, but then when the damping reaches this level, what you have is just one half oscillation and then it can't rise again. So that would be where the damping would actually kick in and if you increase the resistor for this value, you would go into this whole damping <coughs> where it won't oscillate at all. So in this case, it's just one of oscill half oscillation and it, it dies out. Okay. So that's the time scale that's important is the, the time scale. This time scale is the time scale of the oscillation. This time scale is usually a very long time. Okay, so that's how an oscillating circuit works. In nature, when you have some, it won't oscillate for infinity because it would damp out because of resistances which are present in the circuit. If you have an NC circuit, it would eventually die out. So you have to constantly ramp, provide it with a kick every time it damps out. That's how circuits are because you never have a zero resistance unless you have a superconductor. That's another story. Any question in there? And then I go to the next topic. We did these three conditions for simple harmonic motion, if you remember, in mechanics as well. But we didn't have too much time in there. So. Have you done differential equation in calculus 2 or Kami Connect? Ah, so we will get it. I have it. Okay, let me start with slightly different thing, which is the vector calculus. So, so up till now uh, might be helpful for the exam, but uh, the rest is just if you want to learn, you can learn, otherwise it's an option thing. So the next lecture will be the same as well. We don't have to come if you don't want to, but so, so let's start with something very simple. Let's say if you have a function and a scalar function, such as f of x. And you want to know how does the function varies with x. So let's say if I draw this f of x, x, f of x, and this a function like this corresponds to anything. If you want to know how does the function vary along x, what do I need to find? It's derivative, which is v df by dx. So if I know the derivative at any location, I would know how fast the function is changing, or whether it's increasing or decreasing or not changing at all. So that would be given by this, this information, which is f bar of x. So let's go to a slightly more, what about a scalar field? Let's say if you have a field, now you don't have just one direction, but you have two directions, an x direction and a y direction. And you have a scalar, not a scalar function, but rather a scalar field, which is described by let's say f of x, y. So each x, y point has a certain value. This can be, for example, temperature, which is a scalar function of x and y. So let's say 
if you have a temperature which is higher in the middle and it is cooler, progressively cooler as you go out. You might have seen such maps. Weather or any other thing. Okay? Normally, you hear that this is a more uh, red is warm and the blue is warm. How do I find gradient in this case? I can have two gradients. Gradients along x and gradients along y. Okay? So at a certain location, let's say here. Here I What should be the gradient? So if I go in on this direction, I want to see if the, the scalar function is dropping or it's moving up. And in this direction, I want to see if the scalar is moving up and down. So what you have is now f of x, y. So you can have two equations. You have del f by del x, and you can have del f by del y. Do no so what should be del f by del x? Would it be positive or would it be negative? This side we have the arrow temperature kya ho hai? Decrease ho hai. So df by dx would be negative. So that would be a negative number. What would happen to the df by dy? Again negative because the temperature is again decreasing in this direction. What if I would be here? And I again try to find out what would be the del f by del x? It would be negative again. What would be the del f by del y? It would be positive. So you can have different combinations of these two depending on where you are situated in the. So the important thing here is that those differential doesn't stay the same. They keep on changing depending on where you are in the field. So, so that's, that's the. So, what you should have in general is a differential in more than in one direction. Not in one direction, but in more than one direction. And how do you define it? Then you can say that you have a change, you have different change along x, you have different change along y at each point within the field. So you define a new operator, which is a vector operator. called as del operator and this is del f by del x x plus del f by del y y which gives you how much would be the change along x how much would be the change along y if you sorry there's an operator change along x it would change you change along y so with along x, whether it is increasing along x or whether it is decreasing along the x unit vector, or whether it is increasing along y unit vector, whether it is. So that's the operator which you have to use. And how do you extract that information from this function? You apply the operator on this function, so which is del epsilon f of x y. That will be equal to del f by del x x plus del f by del y. Why? So this would give you a change along x, this would give you the change along y. And the beautiful thing about it is that once you derive it, you can put different values of x and y, like you can put this value of x and y, which would be let's say x1, y1, or you can put this value of x, y, and x2, and this, this would give you a positive, a negative along y, and a negative along x, this would give you a positive along y, and a negative along so you can put any value within that space and it would give you the corresponding gradients along x and along y. Okay, so that's the gradient. So that's a very important, a very beautiful thing. This thing gives you information about local information. It doesn't give you global information. It gives you information about local points. So let's extend that discussion to vector field. Let's say if I have a vector field, they are slightly different fields. So this is x, this is y. Let's say I have a vector field of this sort. Then
what would this corresponds to? This would correspond to a positive charge over here and a negative charge over here in terms of electric field. So this is sort of a vector field. Let's I call this vector field as F. Such that this vector field is a function of x and y. And this F can be electric field, it can be magnetic field, it can be any vector field. So what would be the effect of this DIN operator on such a vector field rather than a scalar field? So what you are doing now is multiplying. So here you multiply a vector with a scalar, but now you have to multiply a vector with a vector. And you can do it in two ways. You can now either have a del operator dotted with your vector field, which will be del dot f of x, y. Or you can have a del operator crossed with your x field. And you both kind of products are possible. And both of them would give you completely different information about the field. Let's say I have this operator. So del dot f, if I apply in this field, if I apply del dot f in, in this location, and then I, which is point number one, and then I do it at this location, which is point number two. So if you do del dot f at one point, what you would get is a positive value. But if you get del dot f at the point number two, you would get a negative value. So this del dot f gives you information about the divergence of the field. Or the divergence of the vector field. So whether a vector field at a certain location is going coming out or whether it is coming in. Similarly, if you do it for this one, it will also give you. So imagine if you do a line, in a surface in field, Gauss, Gauss function tells you the same thing. What do you do in the Gauss function? You do it. You, you make a Gauss surface, for example. And then you say how much is the net flux through the Gauss, Gauss surface. And then it tells you whether the field is coming out or whether the field is coming in. But what would, would it tell you in this case? Nothing. It would give you zero. Because in some cases it's coming out, in other cases it's coming in. It won't give you the change from point to point. But if you do a differential operator at this point, it would give you a positive value. If you do a differential at this point, it would give you a negative value. So a differential can give you local information that's important. And in the del case, it gives you information about the divergence of the field. What about this thing? Gradient of This thing is called as the kernel of the electric field, of the vector field. So let's say if you have a vector field of this form, <laughs> so again, you can find the curl at this location, you can find the curl at that location. So this del cross f, if you if you do it at this location, then it would give you a certain non-zero value, and it would be let's say a positive value. But if you do this curl function here, it would give you a negative value because the field is rotating in the opposite sense. Of this. So this del cross f give you information about the rotation of the field and locally whether the field is rotating or whether it's not rotating. Of course, if you apply a curl here it would give you zero because there is no rotation. Anywhere along this, it would give you a zero curve. To the electrostatic curve, there is no curve of field. So how do you find, let's say, how, how do we know about the curl in a field, in a vector field, in an integral sense? You make a path P. In this case, you had a surface S which was enclosing a certain volume V 
and you were looking at whether the flux lines were coming out of the surface or whether they were going in. In this case, we have a path P, and how do you see uh, around path P is you take a dot product of the field along dS over the path and then see whether this thing comes out to be zero or whether it's zero. So in this case, if you are integrating along this line, you would be you would have positive contribution, but if you compare, you would have negative contribution because the field is against the ds. So overall, you would get a zero value. Right? But such an integral won't give this local information. See? So this integral would give you the curve along this path, but it won't give you that you have the field are changing in the in the middle. In one point, it's uh, curve in one direction. In other point, it's curve in another direction. So that's the information which is encoded in this. So there are two theorems in vector calculus, which are so. Once you know what what those things mean, let's come to the two theorems which are in the uh, vector calculus. One is called as a divergence theorem, which tells you that if you have a del dot f and if you integrate over the volume p let's say such a volume p this is a volume p which is enclosed by the surface s then this is equal to f dot p a over the surface s So, if you take the del, which is a divergence of the field within this volume, then this should be equal to the flux of the field across this surface S, which is given by F dot dA. There's the flux of the field across the surface S. This is one theorem. The other theorem is, as I call it, as Green's theorem. And it tells you that if you have del cross F, dotted with a dA around a certain surface S. So this is part P, and this is the surface which is enclosed by this part P. Then this is equal to F dot dS along that part P. So those are the two integrals which are. Of course, it makes sense that if this is something which gives you the divergence, it should be related to the, the Gauss theorem, which is an integral over the surface. And if this is something which gives you the curl, it should be related to a line integral. So that's what exactly you have. You have a curl, which is related to a line integral, and you have a divergence, which is related to a surface integral. So let's come to our four Maxwell equation. So the only three things I have shown you how does the del x on the vector field and those two theorems? That's the only thing you need to know. So let's write down all the four different uh, Maxwell equations. E the A around the surface S equals to Q enclosed by epsilon naught and then you have V dot D A over this circle S this equals to zero and a path P E dot D S for path P equals to minus D by D T V dot D A surface S and V dot D S which is also path P equals to minus mu naught i enclosed plus epsilon naught d by d t. So these are the four Maxwell equations. Let's start with this one. These are the integral form of the Maxwell equation. But the, of course the problem with those integral form is they would give you the values along a certain path or a certain surface, that won't give you local information. 
So let's start with this one, E dot dA over a surface S. So you have a surface S, and you have a volume which is in flow, so there's the volume, and then you have some charges in there. So let's say you have some charges in the search of charge density. So the charge density, what's the charge density normally is given by dQ divided by d volume. That's what it is. So what would be the total charge in a certain volume dV? Let's say I take a small volume dV, the charge, then volume density equals to rho dQ. That's the charge which is enclosed in this small volume as equal to rho multiplied by dV. What would be the total charge which will be enclosed in the total volume? Then I have to integrate over it. If I integrate over the whole volume, I would get the total charge which is inside that volume, and that volume is enclosed by a surface S. So this equation I can write it on the right hand side I have what? Charge which is enclosed. So multiply by 1 over epsilon naught. So 1 over epsilon naught multiply by the charge enclosed. And what is that thing? That is rho dV over the volume V such so that this surface encloses this volume V. Okay, so you have that thing. So let me rearrange it in a certain way that this is equal to del cross E dot B A over a path P. This is equal to minus Now 
up in here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's not a closed surface. Is it? ठीक है, that's what you have. So what I have done is dy dt को मैं integral के अंदर ले लिया। So what you have is this thing dotted with dA over a surface S, and here you have this thing dotted with dA over a surface S, which tells you the del cross E equals to minus dB by dT. So I am writing del by del. In case B is also a function of position. So normally, this d by d t when when you have a total flux, then the total flux can change due to the B. It can change due to something else. But if you take it inside, you have to make a differential. The change in B just due to the change in time. So if you are just looking at the change in B, just then you have to make Let's look at the third, fourth equation, which is part p v dot d s. What is this equal to? Again, is there a problem here? Yeah. Okay. So, what would be that thing? I can write as del cross f dot d a over surface s. What is that thing? mu naught, I enclose, I write, wrote it in a way that I is equal to J dot d a over a surface S. So I can write I enclose is equal to J dot d a over the surface S plus epsilon naught d by d t of E dot d a over a surface S. So, del cross F dot d A over a surface S equals to mu naught mu naught J plus mu naught epsilon naught d E by d T and all of this dotted with d a over the surface s. So I have so j dot d a, e dot d a. So what I can do, I can sum j with e, but you don't not only have e, but you have d by dt. So that's d e by dt multiplied by mu naught, and I have also multiplied by epsilon naught there. So that's, that's the equation you have. Okay, so which means that this thing is equal to that thing, and you have your four maxwell equation that is del cross b equals to mu naught j plus mu naught epsilon naught del e by del t that's the fourth maxwell so now we have converted those four equations the integral form I think in the differential form which is the first one is del dot e equals to rho by epsilon naught the second one is del dot b equals to 0 the third one is del cross e equals to minus db by dt the fourth one is del cross b equals to mu naught j plus mu naught epsilon naught del e by del t. So those are the four, this is the differential form of the Maxwell equations. And this is something which, would be, which you would study in the next course, which will be a part of a continuation of this course, is electromagnetic field and waves. So if you are in a double E, you would also do that. If you are in physics, you would also do take that course, which would only deal with a differential form and would not deal. You see the benefit of what the differential form gives you. It gives you much more freedom in terms of how you see the field rather than because in the integral form you are always you are always bound to your surfaces or you are always bound to your paths. And you would only know information along that path and not anywhere else. 
but this thing gives you more freedom that if you can find the divergence, you can find the divergence at each point, and that that gives you this extra benefit of finding over the character of the previous. Whether it's diverging, it is curling, or whatever it is. And how does this divergence or curl change from point to point? Okay, so this I would like to finish this thing today. From these four equations, I won't show you, but you can try it out. Try it out. You should get if you take a differential of it again, I have a time derivative those of our iska curlo, what you should get is mu naught epsilon naught 